Well, if I do a little bit of a good job, of a good job today, the Lord will speak, the Lord will to, your speak to your heart. I believe that. I believe that. Does, anybody have, Does anybody have tomorrow off? Don't have to go to work tomorrow? Some of you? Why is that? It's a national holiday. Oh, are you because you're retired? <laughs> uh, it's a uh, holiday. Find that word interesting. Uh, this morning I've entitled my sermon Empty, 1493. And I'll explain what that means in a few minutes. But I want to begin with some quotes by a historian, by a doctor, um, by a somewhat activist historian uh, who's written a number of books um, wanting to shed light and clarity on truth. And uh, his name is Dr. James Lowen, taught in Mississippi for many years and also in the Northeast of the United States. He died in August of this year. Um, and perhaps his most famous book is entitled The Lies My History Teacher Taught Me. So here are a few quotes to begin with. Um, this is all very intentional on my part and very apropos to the things that we have already been discussing this morning in our worship service. So I'll read the quotes just so uh, they are on the recording and uh, those of you maybe can't see all the way up on the wall there. The antidote to feel good history is not feel bad history, but honest and inclusive history. I thought, wow, that is, that's an amazing statement. Whether we're dealing with any number of issues, I thought there was deep truth there. And then this quote, I hope this was near the end of his life when he knew that he didn't have much time left. He, he died uh, of bladder cancer, I believe, and uh, has a website, had a blog, um, and he wrote this to, to all of us. I hope, hope all of you will use my new website at justice.com. Tugaloo, is that how you say that? Those of you from the Southern United States, dot edu, to cause social and intellectual change. With your help, we can all use the energy. And I can't think anybody would debate that term, energy. With your help, we can all use the energy freed by the Black Lives Matter movement and George Floyd's death to create a new America in which accurate history prompts positive social change in the present and such efforts lead to a nation willing to face its past with both eyes wide open. And then this third quote to begin with this morning. Community, we've been talking about church. Matt challenged us to find that commitment to love and to brotherhood and sisterhood across differences, right? This brother, Mark Charles, who is a Navajo brother, says this, community is built on common memory. Tomorrow 
In 36 states, a national holiday entitled Columbus Day will allow many people not to go to work. In 14 states, including the state of Minnesota, the name of tomorrow has been actually lawfully changed to become Indigenous Peoples Day. I'm proud of the fact that Minnesota is one of 14 states. Now, I have on here, on the notes there, and I only have one slide today. Uh, the term doctrine of discovery. How many, well, I won't do a show of hand, but it may be old hat to some of you and a, a phrase that is fairly new to you and maybe not sure exactly all what it means. When Christopher Columbus uh, landed in the Caribbean in 1492 and went back to Spain in 1493 to report on what he had found, there were the, the I would suspect probably the most authoritative voice in the world at that time came out of Vatican City was the Pope, the head of the Christian church community for all practical purposes around the world. Now, there had been a split with the East and Orthodox. I will give you that. The Protestant Reformation had not taken place yet. But he gave, the Pope at that time, gave a papal, what's called a bull or a papal decree, that became known as the doctrine of discovery. So it's as ancient as 1493 and as present as 2007 when the United States Supreme Court used the phrase in a ruling. So we're not talking about some, something only in history. The doctrine of discovery basically said this, for those that had discovered new lands, if there were not Christians on those lands, and if those lands were not governed by farming and fencing for all practical purposes, or governed by Christians, then the locals had no human right towards the ownership of land. And number two, that those who, whose lands, who, who lived on those lands were not fully human. That is, in a nutshell, the doctrine of discovery, which allowed the history that would take place, it was sanctioned by the Christian church. Merciless Indian savages, in quotes. How many of you might know where there what that, where that phrase is found, in which document of the United States? The Declaration of Independence. All men are created equal. I'm not sure about women. We know that the US Constitution did not give full humanity to Africans or to those of African descent born in this country. We know that. But did you also know that this is in the Declaration of Independence? Shortly after the phrase, all men are created equal. But those 
merciless Indian savages are not equal. So, a little bit, a brief, albeit brief, truth telling about tomorrow. And now, I want to read you and, 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 and not really do a lot with it. I'm just going to read it to you and maybe share a few thoughts because you want to hear from God, not Pastor Jeff. But I pray that God would speak through me as I read to you scripture. I have tried to teach over the years consistently. Repetition is good pedagogy, right? That this is not God. Sometimes I think people look at the Bible as though it's God. The Bible is a library of books made up of many voices written over thousands of years. In my humble opinion, it can only be humbly understood when, under, when, when one understands the trajectory from beginning to end. So in my opinion, Scripture is a book made up of many voices that the Spirit uses of God, the Spirit of God uses to bring conversation among those voices to us. And so it's a book in dialogue with itself. And so now I'm going to read to you uh, out of the Hebrew scriptures and out of uh, the Second Testament, what we often refer to as the New Testament, uh, though I think it's really just a matter of continuation of a story. It's a story about a particular people in which we who are of the Gentile persuasion have been grafted on, invited to participate and become brothers and sisters with. I've often said in one of my Bible classes, you know, that there's, there's not any, um, any Swedish people in here. My grandmother is from Wales. I, I don't know if this story is about the Welsh people or not. I, don't, I can't find it anymore. Um, I'm not being, I'm not try, trying to be funny or make light of scripture. I'm certainly not. I'm going to read you two incredibly important narratives. Incredibly important because I want you to have what Mark Charles, the Navajo man said, common memory. The first comes from 2 Samuel chapter 5. I'm going to read to you verses 1 through 8. Incredibly important text. It's about when David is crowned king in the city of Hebron. If you read 2 Samuel verses or chapters 1 through 4, you will read of incredible violence. You will hear of hands being cut off and feet being cut off and heads being cut off. Of human bodies being displayed as warnings. You will hear of violence as revenge. You will read of King Saul's death in which he is wounded in war and asks somebody to help him die. At least that's the man's story. He helps King Saul die. 
He takes Saul's uh, emblems of his kingship to David. In scripture, there is a love-hate relationship between David and Saul, the first and second king of Israel. And what David does is he kills him because this man killed Saul or helped Saul die. And right after that narrative comes this narrative. 2 Samuel chapter 5. Now, for those of you who are Bible geeks, you'll find really two different Davids presented in Scripture. One in the readings of Kings and one in the readings of 1 and 2 Saul, Samuel. In one version, you'll have a man after God's own heart. In another of the versions, you'll have what one teacher of mine called the legacy of Saddam Hussein. Common memory, folks. Where does the violence reside? Is it in them? Only them? In that person? Those people? Or does the violence reside in me? Does the violence reside in our society? Does the violence reside in the way that we tell history or not tell history? How do we heal from a culture of violence? The other day I heard a story of two cars racing down the street, shooting at each other, crashing, and a young woman on a scooter died on the side. What would you call that, Brian? You would call that senseless violence. Why is it in me? After David kills the messenger, it reads like this. Then all of the tribes of Israel came to David at Hebron and said, look, we are your bone and flesh. For some time, while Saul was king over us, it was you who led out Israel and brought it in. The Lord said to you, it is you who shall be shepherd of my people Israel. You who shall be ruler over Israel. So all the elders of Israel came to the king at Hebron. And king David made a covenant with them at Hebron before the Lord, and they anointed David king over Israel. David was 30 years old when he began to reign. And he reigned 40 years. There's one of those 40s that we talk about that is repeated over and over in scripture. At Hebron, he reigned over Judah seven years and six months. And at Jerusalem, he reigned over all Israel and Judah, north and south, 33 years. The first narrative after he is anointed king. The king and his men marched to Jerusalem against the Jebusites, the inhabitants of the land. Who said to David, you will not come in here. Even the blind and the lame will turn you back thinking David could not come in here. Why? It was a walled city. Ancient cities had walls around them. In fact, I think part of my understanding is that uh, Manifest Destiny or the Doctrine of Discovery also used the theological backdrop of the fall of Jericho as biblical theological justification, not only the dehumanization of the other, but back to this. Nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion, which is now the city of David. David had said on that day, whoever would strike down the Jebusites, let him get up the water shaft to attack the lame and the blind, those whom David hates. 
So how did David is being taunted by the people from around the, 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 the wall, I suppose near the top of the wall, at least, you know, I've seen walled cities in movies, never been, well, I actually have been to Quebec City, that was a walled city. Um, and uh, there, David and his men are being taunted, saying, even the blind and the lame could defeat you, David. David says, yeah, well, I'm going to go up through the water shafts here. And when he went into the city, first thing he did was he killed the blind and the lame. And verse 8 says this. Therefore, it is said, the blind and the lame shall not come into the house. What house? house where God lives, the temple. So in the time when Messiah Jesus comes, the blind and the lame are not allowed into the house of God because of this text, because of this ancient memory, because of this story. Kirk, you must leave because you're in a wheelchair. You're not allowed here. Because somehow, God only wants perfection. That's the sacrificial theology of the system of sacrifice. It must be perfect, unblemished, because that is who God is. And that is what God wants. And that's why we sing songs about the cross as though it's somehow what God wanted. Because it's the perfect, unblemished, human, divine sacrifice. There's a whole way of seeing, of understanding scripture, of understanding who God is understand you adopt that now the second story and then I'm going to play you a song on YouTube the second I said I wasn't going to talk a lot <laughs> I'm not oh I am sorry Matthew 21 12 through 18 this is A famous text that you will understand the context of. Then Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who were selling and buying in the temple, and he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. He said to them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. The blind and the lame came to him in the temple. Can you believe that? And he cured them. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the amazing things that he did and heard the children crying in the temple, a different vision of God. You understand? Or maybe not different, but more holistic, perhaps, is the better way of saying it. When's the last time the children have cried because they saw God show up, right? Hosanna to the son of David. I'd like to play you a song. It's entitled Ghost Dance by a, by a, by a man named uh, Jim Miller. He... Uh, a ghost dance was a part of, um, is a part of um, spiritual renew, renewal movement that took place in the late 1800s among Native brothers and sisters in the West. I believe it emerged out of Nevada. It probably, historians say, uh, plays a role in 
the tragic events at Wounded Knee in, in, the, in the Dakotas uh, where US troops um, um, massacred many women and men and children. Um, uh, and so I, I wanna end with this song as a, as a hope of uh, meaning for you regarding tomorrow, uh, a call for us. It's also a song about Messiah. It's a song about God. May God speak to us. This song was written out of prayer and out of, um, it was actually out of disgust of seeing a photo exhibit in Winnipeg on the ghost dance and uh, Wounded Knee Massacre, December 29th, 1890. I saw some photos up there in an um, exhibit that um, literally made me feel sick to my stomach and start crying. These are photos that the United States or a lot of books have never seen. These are photos that show um, soldiers uh, taking the breasts off dead women, Indian women's bodies and playing catch with them on bayonets. These are photos that show um, our U.S. Army uh, stepping on, on little babies, frozen babies in the snow and throwing them around. These are photos that are sick. And I don't know where they're at now, but I saw these things and it shocked me to the point I couldn't sleep at night. And um, I went, uh, my next gig was in Nevada. I was working for the Nevada State Arts Council. And I was sickened by these photos, and I'm, I'm sick of a record company telling me what to write, what's hip, what's happening. Uh, I refuse to be that type of artist, and I won't be that artist. I'm going to write what I see, what I feel, what I believe. So lo and behold, I end up in uh, Yarrington, Nevada, not not sometimes you ever get to a place and you're right where you should be and then you don't even know where you're at meaning that you know just I had no idea I was in the birthplace of the ghost dance movement Yarrington Nevada where Vavoka was born and raised and he was part of the Paiute nation and I was playing for some school children and four beautiful elderly women came up to me in a jeep and um, they said uh, do you know who we are I said no I don't they said well we're from the Paiute nation and um, we would like to take you out where our great-grandfather had his vision for the ghost dance. So they took me to the desert, and um, I, I ended up spending three hours in prayer where Wavoka actually had his vision for the Messiah coming back for the Indian people. That night in a casino, above a casino in a hotel, I wrote this song called Ghost Dance. Now you would think that after seeing those photos and after going to Wounded Knee ever since I've been nine years old, after supporting the American Indian movement that I'd write the most pissed off song you could imagine. And I was ready to do that. But you know what? I wrote this song and um, as I started to write about these people I started to hear their voices as they were being shot for dancing for God, for dancing for the Messiah. They were shot down. I don't know if you knew this but in Vietnam remember the, I don't know how to pronounce it, My Lai Massacre, My Lai do you remember, do you know that that guy was a court martial they used the, the uh, legal aspects of the Wounded Knee Massacre to get this guy down because it was the same thing, shooting innocent people. And um, so I dedicate this song to their spirits and as I saw their spirits, I saw them healed. And while I'm seeing these people healed and dancing in God's creation, I not only saw them healed, their wounds and they're dancing and they're singing and they're beautiful people. Those babies are alive somewhere. I saw my own father who took his own life in 1993. I wrote this song in 1999. I saw my own father sober again. I saw him dancing. I saw him waiting for me to take me trout fishing one day. I saw healing. I saw things that I never thought I would. And this was a spirit song. This was a song written directly out of the spirit. It wasn't meant for the pop radio, but it became top ten it became number one on American Indian radio it became a top ten song on college radio in the 90s I was touring with Pearl Jam and Tori Amos it became um, the best album of the year 1999 Native American Music Awards 
It's a song written out of prayer and after being dumped on a major label. That's what happens. But sometimes we have to be dumped and pushed down because, you know, not like our people, people of color aren't used to being dumped on. It's, it's, not, it's nice to be lifted once out of the dumps. And this song lifted me in places I never knew. This is called Ghost Dance. I want to go where the blind can see yeah. I want to go where the lame will walk I want to see the sick ones clean Where the deaf can hear the silent talk I said where are you going yeah. To a ghost dance in the snow A mighty warrior finally coming home. Oh, I want to go where the dead are raised and where are they are. Where the mind line lays down with the lamb, where are they are. Oh, I want to stand where God is praised. And I want to ride across the plains to the promised land I said, where are we going, yeah To a ghost dance in the snow I am a mighty warrior, yeah Finally coming home Gonna need to raise your voice. No starvation, have plenty to eat. No guns, no wars, no hateful noise. Just a victory dance, I'll never taste defeat. Where there's nothing done, I said they can't be forgiven. Yeah. Every step you take, it's on sacred ground. Walk away from death to the land of the living Where all the lost tribes are finally found Oh yeah I said where are we going To a ghost dance in the snow I am a mighty warrior I'm finally coming home Yes, I'm finally coming home. For all of us. So tomorrow, honor your brothers and sisters who are here before we. Let's rise and close with the singing of a sweet, sweet spirit.